Please turn in your Bibles to Luke 9, Luke 9, we'll be starting with verse 37. What a, uh, what a wonderful time of worship already, singing those sweet songs, singing about the justification and the future glorification that we, we have in Jesus and for that wonderful time of prayer just now. As we look at Luke 9, you might think this is, this is not exactly a classic Advent text, and you would be right. It's not, but it's where we are in Luke, and it is about Jesus, so we're going with it. We'll probably get through about verse 43 in depth, but I want to read the whole thing together because I, I think it fits together. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, then you know the context that Jesus and three of his disciples were just up on the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus shone like the sun and Moses and Elijah showed up. And now this is what happens next. So Luke 9 and verse 37. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father, and all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. So an argument rose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. This is the word of the Lord. Our Father, this morning as we would prepare for the table, we ask simply that we would see our Lord Jesus and that you would do this by the work of your Holy Spirit. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. In high school, I got involved with the drama club. And of course, if you're involved in the drama club, that involves tryouts, trying to get into a play or on, or on the support staff somehow. And so I would go out semester after semester and try out to try to make it onto the stage. Now, this was before anything like the internet existed, outside the Pentagon, I guess. Uh, and so in order to find out, in between class periods, we had to go to our English teacher's uh, wall with the bulletin board and see if he had posted the new cast. And we had about seven minutes between classes, and the hallways were crowded, so it was always a bit of a challenge, and we were never quite sure when he would post them. We knew kind of what day he would do it, so we'd rush there, and then, oh, there's no list. Then we'd rush again, there's no list. And then semester after semester, I would go, maybe between fifth and sixth period, and there was the cast. And there I would read it down, and there I would see the stars. And, oh, I know that guy. Yeah, he's good. And, oh, why did she make it in? And then, and then I'd look, go all the way down, and I would never find my name. Semester after semester, I never made the list. 
until maybe my junior year, I was put in charge of props for Walter Mitty. That was exciting, especially when I forgot a prop one night and had the star yell at me on stage. That was kind of fun. Uh, the semester after that, I think I made it as the understudy for a guy who had exactly one scene, like 10 lines, and I was his understudy. So I had to show up, but then never got to do anything. Then finally, my senior year, I became a, a minor player in an Agatha Christie mystery called Appointment with Death, which nobody understood. I had a guy with a Cockney accent, and that was terrible. And nobody understood the plot. In fact, the night before, during dress rehearsal, the director, the teacher who picked it, said to all of us, oh, now I get it. <laughs> Do you ever feel that your life is useless and that you are inadequate? That somehow your life does not matter and no one would miss you? Or that you haven't measured up to some expectation. You've not made the list. And often these expectations, to be quite honest, are from our own parents. Sometimes these expectations are from peers or maybe even mentors. Early in my army career and then later in my church career, I was told by certain men that they expected great things from me. They knew I would do great things. And I ended up not. Not in the way they meant. I ended up being a disappointment. Now, this is not a group therapy session, but I, I think a lot of our lives are driven by this sense of inadequacy, an insecurity about our own wealth and what we produce, trying to make the list, trying to show that, that we're getting stuff done and that we are somebody important. Now, some of you here may have the opposite problem. You are overconfident in your gifts and your worth, and we wish that you'd feel uh, a bit less secure in yourself. But even so, it's been my experience that when someone is full of bluster and self-confidence and bravado, it often comes from an insecurity about their own wealth, that they're, tr they're trying to prove something about themselves. They're trying to measure up and display that they are somebody and that they, they're getting stuff done and, and, and they are successful and competent. There is a theme which ties our passage together. I don't know if you noticed this. It, it interests me because Luke edits out so much of this story about the boy with the unclean spirit. If he has the Gospel of Mark in front of him, which I think he does, and he's writing his own gospel account for his own theological reasons, we, we go to Mark's version of this story, and it is much longer. It's 15 verses long, filled with all sorts of detail, but Luke cuts most of that out, and I wonder why. And I think it may be to tie it in to what comes next. That Luke wants to give us a bare bones account so we can get to these next passages. That he's anxious to get to verse 46 in which an argument rises among the apostles as to which of them was greatest. In other words, in both accounts, with Mark and Luke, Jesus and his disciples are coming off this mount of transfiguration, this, this time of glory, and Mark has us enter into this, this, this dispute, this discord around this boy with the Spirit. But Luke gets through that pretty quickly, and instead his attention is in the discord among the apostles about which one is greatest, but yet he he tells us the story about the boy first, and that's what we're going to spend time on this morning. And in putting all that together, Luke is showing us where our true worth lies. Where do you find yourself in this story? Who are you? Well, let's take a look and see. And we read in verse 37, they came down from the mountain, a great crowd comes to meet them, a a man comes up to Jesus and says, Teacher, look at my son. He's, he's my only child, and he has a spirit. And his life is miserable. The spirit 
convulses him. He foams at the mouth, and, and then it shatters him. And, and this word, I mean, other translations say it destroys him. It mauls him. And he's hardly ever left alone. This, man, this father is desperate. It's his only child. And to fully appreciate the tragedy of this situation, so we understand what Luke is doing here, remember the contrast where Jesus and the three disciples had just been, that they had been up on the mountain. Jesus shone uh, like the sun. He was dazzling in front of them. And then Moses and Elijah somehow come back from the dead in their heavenly form. Just like God's glory appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai. But this time, instead of God's glory being in a cloud, God's glory is in Jesus himself. And Peter, James, and John saw God's glory in their friend Jesus. What a wondrous, heavenly event that was. And then they come down off the mountain right into the tragedy of the human race. And our need for Jesus' help and rescue. And what makes the story even more tragic is that the man tells Jesus that they, he asked his, the other apostles, I suppose the other nine, to drive out this demon, but they couldn't. And yet if we go back to verse 1 of the chapter, we see that Jesus gave them authority to drive out demons. And for a time, they were doing that. They were preaching the gospel. They were healing. They were driving out demons. And so the chapter begins with so much hope and promise. The kingdom of God breaking out into the world, not just through Jesus, but through his church, through those who bear his name. And yet they are not perfect. It doesn't always work. And so Jesus comes back down into this situation where his church is failing in their role to drive out evil. It's actually reminiscent, I think, of Moses coming off of Mount Sinai where he has just met with God and given the law and he comes down and he hears a noise. And what's the noise about? It's, it's his own people worshiping an idol. They've made a golden calf. He comes down from the mountain of glory and into the, the wreckage of human rebellion and sin. H have any of you ever felt like that? That you felt lifted up by God's glory? You've been with your brothers and sisters. Everything seems right and good, and then something hits you hard. Often, or sometimes, I, I've left the worship service, and I've just felt like we've met with God, and he's met with us, and I'm so encouraged, and I go home, and receive a text or a phone call from someone in such a hard situation, and I remember we're not in heaven yet. That this life is full of hope and joy and glory, but it's also a life full of having to persevere through trial and trouble and sorrow until we finally make it home. And so that's why Jesus' reaction might seem harsh to us if we look in verse 41, when he says, oh, faithless and twisted generation. You're, you're not right. You're, you're, you're lacking faith that you ought to have in God's goodness. And you're, you're twisted. You're not straight like you ought to be. H how long am I to be with you and to, to bear with you? And this might seem harsh, but we have to remember Jesus was not just fully God. Not, he was not some uh, uh, removed uh, uh, and God, of course, is not that way. But he's not just fully God, but he's also a man. And he's and he knows the way things ought to be, the way things should be, the way things will be one day. And so he is rightly distressed. But, but we have to be, be careful here. Too many preachers take a verse like this and they spend the whole sermon telling us how it's all our fault if something isn't going right, that we lack faith, that we don't pray enough. And all, of that, all that's true. Of course, how many of you pray enough? How many of you have enough faith? And they, they say if anyone's sick, it's, it's your fault for not, not having enough faith. And they will say, we will pray for this person, but if any of you doubt, please leave the room because you're going to ruin it all. And that's all very abusive and frankly very cruel and not in accord with the rest of Scripture. Just read the book of Job. So I don't think that is what Jesus is saying. I think he's frustrated. I think he's sad. But he also knows his apostles are not perfect. That only he is God. 
And in fact, if you know the rest of the New Testament, it's pretty much a record of how Christians keep screwing up, but that God keeps loving them anyway and keeps growing the kingdom through them anyway, despite their weaknesses. Just read the book of Acts or Corinthians or Galatians or Philemon. And this is the gospel. This is right, at, right after this story, right after Jesus says, I will do it. I will heal this boy. Then he goes on to explain that he is going to be rejected by men. And the disciples don't understand it yet. He says, let it sink into your ears. But it doesn't sink into their ears. And, and they don't want to ask him about it. They're scared to, to talk about that, that he's, this great God that they've just seen is now going to suffer. But this is the gospel. This is why Jesus came. Because we couldn't do it. Because we don't have enough faith. Jesus has enough godliness and faith for us. And so we believe in him. And as we believe in him and say we are his, like Gabriel did, then we also learn that he died for all our sins and all of our sins are covered. The sins before you came to Christ and the sins after you came to Christ. That is perfectly covered over. And you will live forever. You will never enter into judgment if you are in Christ. Jesus tells us in John 5 and verse 20. And so, yes, Jesus is disappointed with their lack of faith, but that is why he came. And think about it. When he says, how long do I have to put up with you? What is the answer to that question? The answer is forever. He will put up with us forever, and he covers over all our sins. And he's saying one day all things will be made new when I come again. This is so important for us to remember. If you know the book of Romans, you know that Paul explains that we're sinners in the first few chapters. Then he goes on to explain that we're justified by faith and what Jesus has done. Then he goes on to describe the Christian life, that we grow in godliness as we're filled with the Spirit. But then in chapter 7, he says, guess what? You're going to keep struggling with sin. And then he says in chapter 8, verse 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so notice what Jesus does here. He doesn't just rebuke them. He doesn't just get sad and then walk away and say, Live with your mess. Live with your faith. He says, I will do it. Bring the boy to me. I love this. I think it's at the end of verse 47. Bring your son here. I'm not going to punish this boy because of your lack of faith. And instead, Jesus heals the boy. And we read that, as I guess it's the end of verse 43, Jesus, as the, as the, the verse 42, as the boy's coming, then the demon makes another reaction, but Jesus rebukes the unclean spirit. He heals the boy, and he gives him back to his father. So this is the way it is with us. Has your, has your faith ever failed you at some point? Do you ever have some struggle with sin where you, you just give in again and you hate yourself for it? Or maybe there's some situation where you're, you're, fa you're just filled with fret and doubt. I've lost so much sleep over unfounded fears, often about what I think others think about me. And instead of just asking them, I, just, I lose sleep over it. Or maybe you have committed some real tangible sin with real lasting results. Do you, do you, look, this, do you think Jesus just scoffs at you and then casts you out and says, live with your mess? And make no mistake, my friends, that, that's the way some people preach Jesus. Some of you are still recovering from that. They will tell you the gospel clearly that that you come to Christ by faith alone, that he loved you enough to die for you. And then uh, what they give you with the one hand, they take away with the other. And they say, oh, but he's so disappointed with you and the way you follow him. My friends, when Jesus determined to love you, he determined to love you all the way and all the time. That's what we see here. He doesn't leave them in their mess but he heals the boy himself. Jesus came to bring life and hope and order and peace. He doesn't abandon us to our doubts. 
but he determines to live with us forever. So, so here is the point. If you have failed in your faith at some point, if, if there is some situation you cannot fix, bring it to Jesus and trust that he loves you. And, and the people that you have hurt and are in that mess, trust that he loves them more than even you do. And keep bringing that to him. Jesus does not punish us because of our lack of faith. He has come to heal the messes that we cannot fix. And as he gives the boy back to his father, just imagine this joy. Imagine the joy of the father to see his son restored. So whatever it is you think you have messed up, bring it to Christ again and again and see what he does. The story is not done yet for any of us. Nothing is outside of Jesus' power and love. There was a family that was involved in our church, and they had four grown children. And this was a, 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 a devout, dear, sweet Christian couple. But of their four grown children, three were not walking with Christ. And so they prayed for all of their kids continually, daily, earnestly. And I joined with them in their prayers, and many of you did as well. And then one by one, we'd watch them come back to Christ. And they would report to me on Sunday morning afterwards, so-and-so is back in church. So-and-so says that they love Jesus and they're following him. One is still left. And so I told them last time I saw them, three down, one to go. We're still praying. And so that's an application I want us all to see here. The Father is an example to us. The man did not give up. The apostles let him down. The church let him down. But he continues in his faith, and he brings his boy to Jesus. And this is so important for us in our day as more and more cases of abuse come out and major Christian figures fall to scandal, major names, some that we would have happily promoted here. So if some Christian leader or the church lets you down in something big or small, never let that Let you lose your faith in Jesus as your Savior and as God. People will fail you from time to time, but then take your case to Jesus himself. He will never leave you or forsake you. And I pray that for people all of the time, even those I have let down from time to time with a lack of pastoral care. Jesus is still there for them. And so now, as we move on, Notice what happens next. Notice notice this phrase Luke says in verse 43. As they watch Jesus heal this mess, as they watch Jesus say, oh, where's your faith? But here, I will fix it. I have come to bring life and healing. Verse 43, all were astonished at the majesty of God. Here is Jesus healing one little boy, and they are astonished at the majesty of God. Some translations say the mighty power of God. Now, when you think of the majesty of God, what do you think of? You think of the Psalms or the Old Testament, and you think of God seated on his throne, surrounded by angels. But here they are. Here they are seeing Jesus take care of one little boy, and there they see the majesty of God. Not just Jesus in all of his glory, but Jesus in all of his mercy. And then that's why Jesus then goes on to say, you think this was great? Look what's going to happen to me next. You think seeing my power and seeing me glow on a mountain was glorious? Wait till you see what I do on the cross. And so the disciples, verse 45, don't want to ask Jesus about this. And so because of that, because they don't want to think about The cross, this ridiculous argument arises in verse 46 about which of them is the greatest. Do you remember when I said I think security or insecurity is at the heart of of what often drives our lives, that 
We have to prove ourselves. Well, here are the disciples. After two years of following this gentle Savior around, and they are still insecure. They're still trying to figure out which of them is the greatest. Maybe they're doing a number count of how many demons they'd each cast out or not. I don't know. But for now, and we'll look at this more next week, for now, just look at what Jesus does and what he says. He brings a little child by his side, and he says, you want to know what greatness is? Whoever receives a little child receives me. Now think about that. They had just seen Jesus in his majestic glory, glowing like the sun. And he says, if you receive a little child like me, then you've received. It's like you've received me in all my glory. And if you've received me, who have you received? My Father in heaven. Now where is it that you look for greatness? It reminds me of what we read from Isaiah 11. The prediction of Jesus coming to make all things right and that a, a, a wolf lies down with a lamb and a leopard lies down with a young goat, but then a little child will lead them all. After all, God himself and all of his majesty came to us as a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And we worship him like that. And if you cannot accept God as a baby, as true greatness, then you certainly cannot accept God on a cross as greatness. And you have no idea what greatness is. So let me ask you again. Where do you see yourself in this story? Maybe you see yourself as one of the doubting apostles. We spent a lot of time on that. That you don't have enough faith. If so, I have good news for you. Jesus loves you anyway, and he's going to keep working through you as you come to him in weakness. But maybe you, you see yourself as the father, and I commended the father to you, that you've got somebody in your life that you cannot fix. Well, then, I have good news for you as well. Keep bringing that person to Jesus in prayer and let him get to work. And I don't know how he's going to answer your prayers, but I know he will. I know he will. That's the gospel. Jesus loves this world. You're still here. You keep praying and loving that person and just see what Jesus does. But maybe... We are not so much the doubting apostles. Maybe we're not so much the desperate father. Maybe Luke wants us to see that we're all like little children. That maybe, apart from Christ, we're this little child filled with evil, filled with distress and chaos, and he has come to heal us. And he's come to raise us up. Maybe, instead of wondering where you are in the list and trying to find your worth and how much faith you have or how much you get done, maybe all you need to know is that you're like a little child and Jesus brings you by his side and says, Welcome. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we come and confess that we do not measure up. We do not measure up to others, and we certainly do not measure up to your standards. But all you ask of us is to believe in Christ, and that he loves us, and that he cares for us, and that he is using us even to bring life to this world, because you have willed it. Help us to believe this with faith until you bring us home. In Jesus' name.